Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to another episode of Boys in the Cave. My name is Tanzan and I'm joined by my co-host Akib. Um, if you guys have been following us from episode one, you would know Akib has been a regular <laughs> co-host back then. So he's making a comeback now. So alhamdulillah, we're actually joined by someone very special today. And I'm actually really excited. And this is actually why I got Akib on today because... It's, this episode's more to do with business, but it's not business per se. It's more so to get a feel for entrepreneurship, even mindset, how to achieve success, all these things that as Muslims you can sort of apply in your life regardless of what profession you're aiming for. That's why I'm very special. Um, our special guest today is Ashik Ahmed. So Ashik is a seasoned entrepreneur, specifically the co-founder, CEO and CTO of Deputy. He is spearheading the international startup that is fast shaping to be one of the most successful Australian companies, being among, among other successful companies like Atlassian, Canva and Campaign Monitor. His team are tackling the problems of workforce management using a unique scheduling software. And additionally, I've actually checked out his articles. He's a Forbes contributor publishing content from his lessons and observations in business. So without further ado, assalamu alaikum Ashik Paya and welcome to Boys in the Cave. Alaikum assalam. Thank you for having me. I'm a listener of your show as well and I'm really excited to be here. This is an exciting episode for both of us. Uh, assalamu alaikum listeners. Um, so Tanzim and I, we ha- are just very interested in the nature of entrepreneurship. Um, finding a problem and trying to tackle it in a unique manner and just, you know, being part of a movement, you know, that's exciting and people can get on board with and be excited about. So, you know, partly the drive for Boys in the Cave was because we wanted to kind of share our content and get feedback. We have our own pursuits in the past. We've mentioned, we've discussed this in previous episodes, but in this case, we just wanted to kind of bounce off our thoughts and ideas and get your understanding and your observations and your lessons in this episode. Yeah, um, absolutely. Look, I mean, uh, life is an opportunity. And you know uh, that you should maximize. That's right. Okay, your time, time on earth in 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 serving Allah and Allah's creation. Mm. And entrepreneurship is a is a great way of of doing that because when you're an entrepreneur, you are actually making wealth. I mean, I'm not going to say creating wealth. I'm going to say making wealth. Yeah, and yeah. It, you make wealth for your uh, employees. You make wealth for your shareholders. You make wealth for your uh, your customers so um it's a it's a it's a great and unique opportunity that's right it's not just about the monetary value it's about you know the the enriching life experiences and also the the knowledge and information you can share among your community that's what's important no, absolutely looking the biggest validation of life comes from enriching other people's lives yeah and entrepreneurship is a great way of doing so that's awesome just to kick it off and give an idea unto the audience of who you are so people who may not be familiar with you specifically i'm sure they've heard about your company but they want to know more about you but in regards to your business specifically i actually read in the sydney morning herald alhamdulillah like boys in cave we do our research before (laughs) our episodes so um it was in the sydney morning herald it was announced on november 29th of last year Ashik's uh, payers company deputy raised a hundred hundred and eleven million dollars in funding. So congratulations on that huge achievement. I know the market, uh, your <laughs> your uh, what what do you call it? Um, as a company, your uh, value yeah, in the market value is like yeah. Um, really it's like big numbers so like obviously that's like a huge achievement for yourself and you know your journey must have been you know full of twists and turns not everyone's life is just smooth sailing but how were your emotions at that time when you got that sort of um fundraising look i mean the 112 million uh, uh sorry 11 or 12 depending on the currency <laughs> conversion yeah, yeah, of yeah. one or two days up there uh, <laughs> struggles the, of uh, actually I mean, <laughs> By the time when when I remember writing the blog post, it was one twelve. By the time the announcement came, it's one eleven. Oh, okay, all right. So uh, look, I mean, emotion wise, I, I tell you what. I mean, when I did the series there, when it was twenty five, sorry, thirty three million, um, which probably didn't get that much of a public publicity as as we did with the series B. Yeah, uh, I remember being in in Cronulla um, uh, uh, Park. <clears throat> next to the beach i haven't seen my family my whole week we're trying to get the deal done it's right before christmas and i remember doku signing and getting the confirmation that um that we had closed the deal and i remember just bawling my eyes out crying 
with that sense of relief. In Series B, it was it was equal, but I suppose I felt it a little bit earlier. Yeah, yeah. But it is it is a great relief, but it, at the same time, it's a great responsibility. I mean, that level of funding means that now that money needs to come into the business, and the business needs to scale up to ensure that it reaches its its its, its full potential. But at the, at the same time, look, I mean. Um, I mean, obviously, born in Bangladesh, came in, came here. A little bit of background about myself over here. Came at the age age of sixteen. Um, not a lot of people get an opportunity like I have. So, in order to ensure that I am absolutely maximizing this opportunity, and that was kind of like having that proof point that okay, I might be on the right track. I've, by no means it's a success, but I might be on the right track. So, yeah. felt felt good. Alhamdulillah, um, it's a it's a it has been a great blessing. I'd imagine it also validates the team effort. Um, the, they invested in your vision uh, and your co- other co-founder. Uh, for, sorry, who was his name? Steve Shelley. Yep. So there, both of your visions and the journey, how it manifested into the certain products that you and the software as a service that you provide. I'd imagine they must feel really joyous about joining you and helping you achieve this vision as well. When you receive those investors, those uh, approvals from the Series B investments. And, Absolutely. And I mean, like I mean that kind of money. You know, no one just takes a bet on it. I mean, there would be, there would be actually a like, gonna have a strong investment thesis behind backing, uh, backing a company. And these are very, very credible investors. Like, you know, IVP. If you look at their portfolio, backing companies like Uber or Slack. Um, a, they're they're very, very well renowned investors, and to have. People like them put their money, be on my board, help me, guide me yeah. to build this company. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's. Uh, I do feel the validation as well as the pressure. Let me yeah, put it that oh way. yeah, definitely, yeah. <laughs> we want to touch on. We'll go a bit backwards, um, but we want to know like where you came from, like what's your background, because a lot of people. The reason we do want to get an idea of your background is because a lot of people that want to succeed in life are just like, oh, you know, the people who succeed had, you know, helping hands or they were privileged in some way and it was easy for them to, you know, get a lot of money and build businesses and stuff. So, to get an idea of where you, uh, how you came to where you are today, could you give an idea, you know, what's your, ba- what's your background, you know, what you studied and how your life was and then how you became how you are, I guess. So I definitely didn't inherit this. <laughs> I can <laughs> let's, clear, let's that. clear that up. Yes. I mean, let's yes. just let's just clear that up. Um, <laughs> but look, I mean, um, so I was born in Bangladesh, um, and if there's anything that shaped me and trained me to who I am today, I'm gonna put it back to back in Bangladesh. I went to Cadet College. I went to Mijapur Cadet College. Cadet so College is like a military school. There we go. So from year seven, so when you were about 12 or 13, you would go to this military school where um, uh, basically it's military training. I mean, for all the hardships I have gone in my life, I think year seven was the hardest year in my life. Was that the beginning? But oh. that's the beginning. So you literally get beaten, slapped, whipped, whatever you can think of for a 12 or 13 year boy. I mean, the traumas and tortures, like, you know, uh, myself and classmates of mine we have gone through in year seven, um, nothing has compared to that <laughs> it later, later in life. So, uh, but, you know, first four years in Cadet College, um, then my family migrated here uh, in Australia, um, originally actually from Melbourne, uh, went to high school in Melbourne and coming as a migrant into this country, Back then, like, you know, uh, family didn't necessarily have the social security support. That's We actually came on the time when government just changed the law that new migrants can't get uh, social security support. So oh, right. Okay. It was, it was really hard. I remember I'm the only one who had employment in my family as a 16 or 17-year-old. And I was getting paid $5.22 per hour working in Hungry Jacks. <laughs> 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 we would, um, you know, uh, I remember used to work. And then I remember actually, you know, I'm going from Hungry Jacks to McDonald's because I was going to quit $6.30 sense okay that was a pay grade <laughs> okay um but you know um, working through that studying at that time and 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 really realizing what, what studying sorry so th- th- that was high school obviously but okay, after, yeah, after yeah, high school enough. i um i went and studied um, computer science in university of melbourne i actually started studying robotics in megatronics but i kind of um realized that i don't have that much passion for um, a mechanical or electrical engineering. So I just focused on the software side, um, and that's how I graduated. But even even studying, I actually had a full time IT job. All right. Um, 
and there's a little bit of a story in there. Uh, <laughs> and this is, I mean, if, if, if there's anything about opportunity, if there's anything about entrepreneurship, um, uh, this is a bit of a funny story. Uh, the funniest story is that I, my high school friend back then, uh, Jesse Stratford, I, I was hanging out um, at his house. We were, you know, we would be playing with computers, writing little softwares in Visual right. Basic ourselves, um, toying around. And I remember one day, uh, one Friday, uh, Jesse's mother um, coming to me and saying, Sheik, do you know anything about SQL? Because Reese, her husband, yeah. they're trying to look for an SQL developer and they can't find anyone. Yeah, yeah. And I, I had this split second thing. Then I was thinking, I actually did not know what SQL even stands for. It stands <laughs> for server query language. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. But I didn't know. And I'm like, what's the likelihood she knows what SQL stands for? Probably zero. Did you ask her? I did not. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like, I think I'll be really good at SQL. I just said that. Okay. <laughs> I didn't say that I know it or not. The question was, do you know? I said, like, I think I could be really great at. And, and she goes, like, okay, I'll call Reese and, you know, uh, why don't you go see him on Monday? And I'm like, I left my friend's uh, house that, uh, that moment. I went to the university uh, library, bought a book on Oracle uh, SQL, downloaded a trial version of Oracle from another friend's house who had very fast <laughs> internet, as opposed to dial-up internet back in the days. Yeah, yeah. Installed it, did every exercise in the book. When I rocked up on Monday, <laughs> I was the SQL guru. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> and did that thing and bang, I have, I, um, 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 I'm in that. Uh, uh, that's how I started my career. That's awesome. And, uh, um, I mean, the lesson in there is that um, every now and then in life, you might get an opportunity. Seize it. Seize it. I mean, there's a great uh, Steve, uh, sorry, uh, Richard Branson quote is that uh, if someone gives you an opportunity, you don't know how to do it, just do it. Figure out how to do it. Agree to it and figure out how to do it. Um, I've learned that quote a long, long time later, but uh, that's uh, that's how I actually got started in the whole, whole world of... Uh, um, being uh, being a software developer, I would say, and then next three years, I was um, like kind of working for that company. Did quite a lot of of uh, uh, different things. Through that, I got introduced to another um, gentleman over here. His name is Richard McIntosh, who who was doing an IT consultancy business. From there, um, he had a customer called uh, Steve Shelley, running one of the largest aviation ground handling business here in Australia, and they were having some employee data collection problem. So I got called in to uh, turn an Excel file into a uh, some sort of access database, okay? And I'm like, I, then I built a, um, I remember, this, this was another funny story. I, I built them a web portal okay. to do this, which they didn't ask for, but they really liked it. Hang on a second. We asked <laughs> for this, we got something. And it's like, and how much is going to be? I'm like, geez, I, it only took me about six, seven hours to do this, but they don't know that. <laughs> 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 Twenty-one thousand dollars. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and they go like, "Sure, okay, let's do this." Okay, oh, well. they're right. I'm like, whoa, "Whoa, okay." And then I'm like, "Hang on a second, I'm dealing with a company, and um, um, and I don't, I probably should get professional indemnity insurance." All right. Okay, I mean, and a professional indemnity insurance is something you do that's in case there's something wrong and they suffer a loss. That's and they sue for you, yeah. Yeah, that you're protecting yourself. So I like, you know, go to get professional indemnity insurance, and the the quote comes in at eighteen thousand dollars. I'm like, okay. Um, that doesn't make any business <laughs> sense now. Maybe I should have just $50,000 then. <laughs> but then I go back to them and say, like, look, hey, this thing you want me to do, I can't do it as a contractor. Your best option to um, get this thing done is to employ me. And they're like, uh, and Stephen is general manager back then, is like, well, we don't actually have anybody in your skill. We don't even know how we, you, like, you know, we would um, kind of manage. I'm like, well, I, I can be an, an employee so that I don't have to go through this and just pay me a salary of $50,000 per year. It's only going to be th three months before I'll be done. But as I go in to come and do this, I'd, uh, as I do this, and like and obviously not the six-hour work, yeah. but I fully flesh out to make sure that it's the right thing that needs yeah. to be, I see that there was so much inefficiencies in the business. And I'll give you an example of inefficiency. Um, every um, fortnight on a Monday, there will be peril. Okay, there's 200 employees that's working for this business. Yeah. And all the timesheets, I mean, this is an aviation ground handling business. By ground handling, I mean, when you go, when you fly into, say, a little airport like, um, say, Maroochydore yeah. or Cairns, okay, where it's not like, you know, as heavy as Sydney or one of some of the big airports, all the people that are in the ground that is loading and unloading the plane, okay, marshalling it in, basically anything other than uh, flying and 
uh, uh, cabin crew uh, or engineering is called ground handling. It's that business. It's his 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 employees in that business will be providing that. And so every Monday, uh, the two hundred employees around the country would fax in their timesheets. Yeah. And there is a fax machine where. 200 pieces of paper and there's a lady who will take that and type that in the keyboard and play everybody so i pick up one of these timesheets and i look at hmm uh john citizen i'm making this name up um in 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 one of the one of the location work from 7 a.m to 9 p.m 14 hours no break wow (laughs) did that monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday saturday (laughs) <laughs> okay, I had a day off on Sunday and did that again Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Th- 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 what about wow, like you know, the amount of overtime and things and penalty, like it's great. All right, cool. I look at again in the next paper and look that the same guy did that again. <laughs> I'm like, I am concerned about the well being of this person, or is he really doing that? I know looking at the uh. flight schedule of cans, there's not that like flights like that all the time that he would be doing this. So I, I find out, I mean, talking to the manager over this, that like you know, doing back pay is a bit of a bit like a painful thing like if you if you say if he did do that work and he didn't pay him for it and he gets to prove that he did do that work there's a lawsuit in there okay and if he if he um you know has done it but you want to um um uh, you want to question that uh, after it has been paid getting money back from him will be a really hard thing so they just do it he's got his signatures the manager's signature and I'm like, so Hanson, who is ending up paying for it for this productivity? It's my business partner. So I like to convince him that, hey, you know, you could be a lot more profitable if we, you know, put in a bit of a timesheet management system. And not only that, I, I observed all these other challenges in the business, like, you know, um, the managers of himself would dread waking up, the, waking up in the morning, you know, in case somebody calls in sick. Because right. usually when somebody calls in sick, uh, what are your options as a manager? I mean, probably all of us over here are salary workers, so we don't we can just call in sick and that's a different story. But if you're an hourly paid worker in a service industry and one of the employees calls in sick, your options are three things. Number one is you can let that position go unfulfilled and suffer on customer service. Option number two is you, the manager, stop doing what you're doing to jump in and go do that. Yeah. Or number three, what is to happen for my co-founder, Steve, is that he would pull out his Nokia 8820D, if you remember <laughs> oh, yeah. back then. Okay, yeah. Going through everybody in the address book, calling everyone, hoping someone's going to say yes. Right. Okay? And there's that, that yes man that always says yes. And that yes man one week will end up doing 100 hours and will have an injury at work. And pardon the French, uh, sugar honey iced tea hits the fan. Okay. That is reality. This is true stories in there. And that is where I'm like, you know, you know what? We need to build. And this is, I'm talking back in 2004, 2004, like, you know, a proper workforce management system without knowing what workforce management system is. It's a scheduling or rostering system and a time tracking system. Now, when we implemented this, it became so successful that for Steve, my co-founder, to grow the business from two people to 200 people took about 10 years. Over the next three years, as I worked with him, we grew the business from 200 people to 1,400 people. Okay, wow. 7x growth. Uh, and not only that, I mean, Steve, being a small business owner for his first um, 10 years, it was so tough because in the world of aviation, it's a very, you know, unionized, uh, uh, you know, workforce. It's 24 hours. High pressure. It's, it's, it's highly compliant, you know, like CASA and Australia has one of the highest... Uh, like you know sa- safest aviation like you know um, record so it's really really compliant means that you know you don't get to cut corners not that anybody wants to cut corner you would cut corner in there but that meant it was really high pressure so the quality okay. assurance is very top notch very very top notch in there so that meant that you know um, he was always on the job yeah. okay I mean he was so devoted and so dedicated that he actually didn't even see his own kids grow up wow. he goes through the, like you know a, a family breakup but as I started working with him and thing, you know, he had a new family, he had a new child. So in a sense, like another you know, business due seven times and at the same time, he, you know, he got his life back. And all his fa- friends and even our customers at that business started asking, hey, how come your business is just scaling so well and, you know, we can't, um, and we're still struggling? Um, and I had reached my business, like, you know, goal with that business and I was leaving and Steve goes, like, you know, hey, why don't we, why don't we start something, uh, yeah. like, you know, for what you had done? And I'm like, mm. 
only if we are 50-50. And only... Equal partners, okay. And, then, and, and my hypothesis is that if I can make a difference in one entrepreneur's life, what if I could make a difference in every other entrepreneur's life uh-huh. in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the world? Because it's not just that his wealth grew, like there's you know, 1,200 extra people who found employment. Okay, that those families actually, um, you know, uh, benefited from it as well, uh, means like you know because of the service they were providing, um, like you know, a economical air travel became a reality here in Australia yeah. as well. So the socio-economic impact of what we did had a profound sustainable return in there, and that if that can be replicated across the world, that is something that um, you know was a unique opportunity for me. So that's how Deputy got funded. The co- reason we call the company Deputy is because it's the second in charge to the business owner. Hey. Another name for it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And we got <laughs> Deputy.com as a domain as well. <laughs> Even though someone was scoring on it for $160,000 or euros actually. Oh. Way. But I mean, in GFC, he couldn't sell it. So we got it for 30. <laughs> <laughs> so like most of the international regulations, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah okay. There's a lot to uh, unpack. Oh, oh, absolutely. I actually do want to talk because, you know, we don't want to kind of diverse we do want to talk more about you know the idea of spirituality islam how it kind of plays into it but one thing that i've have realized from your experiences is the ability to adapt and work to the situation so for example when you first started out when you got that job with the it um, company you were willing to put in the extra yards you're like you're a bit gutsy you know you you know it was like two three days to the job and you just like got your textbook out and learned it you know what i mean and that's like a really good mindset to have as an entrepreneur. And it's not just specifically, like it doesn't have to be on a career-oriented way. It can just be in life skills, you know? Like when you have to adapt to the situation, when you have to play your cards right, when th- something in your life kind of halts your progress in what you want to achieve, then you can kind of maneuver and work out a way to make it happen, you know what I mean? Because a lot of people, like even for myself, if I was, like if someone, like my mom would, you know, I'd be, I don't know, probably eating junk food in front of the TV, on the couch, watching, you know, some Netflix or whatever. My mom comes in like, oh yeah, uh, my uh, co-worker, they need an SQ or I'd be like, I don't care, like whatever, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but then you were able to kind of capitalize on that one moment and it's actually like, changed you know it's kind of set your trajectory in terms of what you are today so that's something i do want to hone on so what is is that something you've kind of grown up with or is, is that a skill that you've kind of honed like uh, throughout the years like or is it just your personality like or what advice would you give to someone as to in noticing what the opportunities are among and you know the people you uh, you know you kind of live with and work with is that what you're trying to get at Tanzu? Yeah, no, yeah, i think like, i think the question if i can unpack your unpacking question over here is that yeah. like you know <laughs> I mean, what are the attributes, what are the lessons over here that someone can learn from that, you know, just say yes to everything? Is that the, is that the, is that the, I wouldn't say so. Look, I mean, here's the thing. Um, I have learned hard in my life over here is that um, there's some rules you should not break or you can't break. You can't break laws of physics. Okay. What is SQL? SQL is a man-made technology. I'm a human too. It was made by another human. Can I learn and do it? I should at least give it a go. Okay? Yeah. yeah. I should at least give it a go. I mean, it's, it's a man-made thing. I mean, there's some things, no matter how hard you try, you probably can't do because of limitations that other things you may have. Of, like, and I, I, if I wanted to be an NBA player, I think my <laughs> NBA player, sorry, like it would be a massive thing, a delta between what I am or what I could be or a rugby player or something like that. But... If something that I'm passionate about and I think I can, I can, I, I, I have a gut feel that I can do it, yeah. then I should, I should give it a go. I mean, I suppose that's also about entrepreneurship a little bit. I mean, entrepreneurship is defined as like Reid Hoffman. Um, there's another podcast called Master of Scale that I listen to and I'll help yeah. any entrepreneur to listen to as well. Reid Hoffman is the former... Uh, founder of LinkedIn, LinkedIn for that's example. That's right, yeah. Okay. And uh, he goes like entrepreneurship is jumping off a cliff and building a plane as you're falling, hoping you might be able to build a plane and not die in there. Well, so um, I suppose that was my first attempt at... Uh, I have other, other quite a lot of stupid examples I give you in, uh, prior in my life. I, I once thought I could swim and I jumped into the water thinking I'm going to swim, but I actually drowned <laughs> <laughs> and I had to get saved. Okay, yeah. So I think I've been crazy all my life to some degree. Um, in there and uh, Alhamdulillah I've been uh, saved every time um, uh, um, it's, it's the blessings of life but uh, 
No, I mean, it's about, it's not about being necessarily gutsy, I would say. I don't think it's about guts. I think it's, um, it's about giving it a, giving, a, giving it a go. I, I wouldn't call myself somebody, like I would never go pick a fight in a bar or something like that or yeah. in a pub or something like that. Right. That's not the kind of guts over here that I would say. But if there's an opportunity that I think I can do it, I mean, what's the worst thing that, that's going to happen? Yeah. If I fail, I fail. But if I don't give it a go, I would never know. Okay, so if the opportunity has been given, I will, I will give that a go. And I can tell you that for um, two out of 10 things I succeed in, there's about eight things I fail at but I probably don't give up on my failures over here. I will keep trying. And that is the thing. As I said, life is an opportunity. There are things you will succeed at. There are things you will fail at. Um, and um, it, the biggest learning, I would say, is that success and great things will happen at the edge or outside of your comfort zone. Okay? This is my comfort zone. This is what I can do. I know or thing. But that is not what is going to make you successful in life. Okay. In order to succeed, and I by no means I will consider myself successful for the record, it will be outside of your comfort zone. You have to get outside. You have to get out of that couch, watch yeah. Netflix, <laughs> and you know, uh, do the hard yard to, uh, to, uh, to, to get it right. And if you look at the stories of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Salam, you know, um, so much hardships he went through in his life. Absolutely. I remember another analogy um, I like to take from is you know when you get sick and if you have like a high fever, people just want to, you know, get in their bed and kind of sleep it off and hope six days, seven days later, they just take the medications and recover. Like that's kind of being in your own comfort zone, sort of sort of getting over, you know, your sickness. But that best way, to be honest, is actually to be in the heat running around to sweat it off. And that's like going out of your comfort zone, but you're going to get, you know, more... Like the bacteria, like it's something to do with like, you know, getting rid of the bacteria out of your system yeah, when you sweat it but out. but you have to do the effort you don't want to go out you know you don't want to run all around like you just to, you just want to chill in your room you know what i mean so yeah it's like yeah, yeah and it could be a mindset thing as well like if you know dopamines get released you kind of just flushes out and brings you in the highest like more positive state and then you know you kind of kind of carries through to your body and just you know it recovers like that right yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah. so that's like one example i like to do in terms of you know going out of your comfort zone in order to you know achieve success as well so you know what Absolutely. you know what I love about the SQL story that you mentioned is that you discovered a need there. And I'm not sure if you went through the process that um people entrepreneurs normally will go through, like, you know, validating the process, whether it's you know, you know, worth your effort, worth the time. But I love the fact that, you know, you found the need, you discovered that need. So I feel like if people, not just entrepreneurs, but lay people, they can capture that mindset of just discovering a need or finding a great idea and just making that there every day. So, for example, remember the buzz that happened when the internet was first, you know, released to the world, right? How people used, you know, how it productivity increased um, and, you know, collaboration increased. Imagine if people you'd utilized software on a higher level now, like they learned Python, or even not Python, maybe even like let's say they're more comfortable and proficient in using Excel. They can automate their budgeting. They can validate their decisions based on data. They can pull data and just be like, all right, is this the right decision I should make uh, for myself, for my family, for my business, for my community? If they can utilize those skills, imagine how amazing productivity would be. No, absolutely. Look, I mean, yeah, at the, from, from the, uh, like, you know, identifying need. Yeah. I mean, I always joke about this. If I went back 10 years ago, Let's just say, let's go back 10 years ago. And I'm going to say, hey, 10 years later, the biggest thing will be a taxi app. All right. Would you have believed me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether, like, our taxis was already there. Who was thinking about Uber back then? Okay. And plus, getting in a car with a stranger <laughs> that you don't know. Okay. So, but see how the world has, world has changed. I mean, I don't, like, you can identify a need and solve a problem. Definitely, that's one thing. But you can also, um, uh, like, you know, think about disruption. Yeah. You can think about, you know, improving people's lives through it. I mean, if, you, if you're solving a problem yeah. and your customers or your users love you for the, uh, for the problem you're solving for them, yeah. there's nothing that probably should stop you from succeeding. Okay. Yeah. The more more thing is that, like, you know, you need to identify how many other people who will have that problem. And you collaborate okay. with them. Okay. Uh, and, and then validating the idea with them and ensuring that, um, you know, that's in, in the software world, we call that TAM. 
you know, total addressable market. Yeah. And that's how you actually determine how big the idea can be. And, you know, I mean, in Deputy's case, uh, two thirds of the global workforce is um, hourly paid or shift workers, yeah. for example. So that's a, that's a massive market. That's a massive market. So that's why there's the investment, um, you know, behind Deputy to go and, and, and really, I mean, we're solving the problem really, really well. And, you know, that investment allows us to even reach, invest more money into product development, in sales and marketing. I mean, in Deputy's case, and never in the history of this company, we have actually done any outbound sales call. It's all been inbound. Oh, okay. Right. So um, when you solve a good problem, that's the thing. Like, and then you, you solve it well for which your customers or users love you, yeah. you, can, you can really, really scale it. In terms of just your experience uh, the hard work that's required you talked more about the steps that you went through um, to get to where you are but in terms of the hard work in each step along the way um, like right now you're obviously running you know a very successful business alhamdulillah so are there any s- sort of suggestions like how is your lifestyle like and how would you how, 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 how have you managed it so far in terms Look, of workload I mean, my journey has changed uh, massively from day zero to now at year 10, okay? Uh, 10 years of this journey. And the way I'd like to say it is that in the early days, it was about proving the idea, okay? At, at one point, I was pretty much doing half the coding that was recorded in the product as a, as a, uh, as a, as a software engineer. But nowadays, I don't actually uh, code that much, very little, I probably shouldn't say that I code very little because <laughs> they're is your okay. Yeah, <laughs> CEO is coding. What is going on over here? Okay. Uh, um, uh, but no, I mean, my my day and my life is a lot different now with a company that has three hundred people versus when the company was only one or two or three people, yeah. for example. Now, I mean, I I really try to uh, maximize maximize my use of time yeah. in here. Um, I mean, being a CEO is is like um, being a high-performing sports athlete where the sports is actually decision-making, okay? My job is actually to make decisions, okay? And usually the decisions that are reaching my plate are the really, really hard decisions that nobody else has been able to actually solve um, in there. So in order for me to be a a really good decision maker, I actually have to rest well, I actually have to eat well and sleep well, and spend quality time with my um, with my family. I mean, I was in Kudba uh, during Juma the other day, and Imam said that um, a tired mind is a blind mind. Yeah. Okay. And could not be more applicable for me. If I'm tired, my mind is blind, and I might be making bad decisions that can have negative impact on someone's life and in this in this com- um, in this company so um yeah i mean I, i'm i'm a very i like to think i'm a very good user of time and i like to ensure that the time is not going in the uh, in the wrong places so what's the type of like let's just say like from early in the morning to the end of your day what's your day like just to give an idea of what it means like what it requires for someone to work hard i guess especially in someone in your position that's running a business just because there's also just because there's personalities in social media that have like you know 18 19 hour work days they hustle from two in the morning all the way through every single day and you see the effects on them physically mentally even though people see that model and they, you know, associated with success. We want to kind of, you know, clarify that's not the case, you know. Um, well, first of all, there are elements of truth with that. There are times I have been like that, okay. I would say. And there are times I am not like that, okay. But it's not like that every day. If you're doing that every day, and depending where you are in your journey of your company, yeah. you, you know, if there's a fire burning somewhere, I might have to do that, Okay. I mean, today, for example, um, you know, it's, it's what, 6 o'clock on Friday afternoon. I, my day started, my first meeting was at 6.30 a.m. And I have been on back to back to back back to back meetings till now, including this podcast <laughs> I'm recording. Yeah, the, my only break was to go for Juma prayer, for example. Um, and other than that, um, it, it, it's been a crazy day. Um, I'm, this is my second podcast, for example, I'm doing today. All right. And awesome. another one this morning with another, um, another uh, um, uh, agency. Plus, I had a... Uh, photo shoot for a, 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 a 
yeah, for an article that's coming out, for example, <laughs> nice. next week. So it's been a crazy day. And I've worked with a number of different teams um, in there. Um, so uh, today is a crazy day, but there are other days that it's not. But I, I uh, and as I said, like, and I mean, I don't think there is anything specific I can give depending like, you know, to any anyone in here. But what I like to do and the advice I have is that um, no matter how much money you have, time is something that nobody can buy. Oh, yeah. So you have to be very, very careful on how you use your time. And um, I I learned something, once again, from another Kudba, actually. I mean, Kudba is my best uh, place to actually learn knowledge that I can go and apply in my Absolutely. entrepreneurial life. And um, and you know, it was talking about perpetual charity. I mean, ch- per- perpetual charity is like you know, like you can donate some money or feed somebody. That's one way of charity. But if you build a house, if you build a well, okay, that keeps on giving forever. I try to spend my time, even if I'm busy, things that will be of perpetual return. Yeah. Okay. That if I invest my time in doing this activity X, and that's going to give more return and return and return after um, after that, then I would go and invest my time behind that. I'm not going to work hard just for the sake of working hard. I will work hard, but where I will allocate my time are the times that it actually will have perpetual return. Like even doing this podcast, I would say that I'm doing this talk once, it will probably reach hundreds of thousands of people over here that you guys have. Sure. And hopefully it inspires other people to go and you know, take the journey of entrepreneurship in there. So this is an activity of perpetual return. There so that's go. why I'm doing this. <laughs> <laughs> and is you talked a lot about your examples you derive from the Qutbah specifically. How much of, you know, Islam or Islamic spirituality or anything from Islam basically helps you to be successful in a business um, setting? What Ooh. sort of lessons have you kind of taken on board during your time? I don't think... I will be who I am or I am where I am today if it wasn't for the lessons that I have learned in Islam. There's, I mean, it's not reading a business book that I have applied it in my way to where I am today. It's literally... Um, um, like, you know, I'll give you a one prime example. All right. I said, like, you know, being CEO is the sports of decision-making, for example. I was in a khutbah where I learned that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said sorry. that uh, there are three things that stops you um, uh, from getting closer to God. Number one is conformity. Okay, Conformity is like you know, doing what you are doing, never asking that could I do it better or differently. So asking the right questions while you're doing something, right? Yeah, okay. okay. Like, you know, this is, is this how we mean to do it? Is there other things I'm learning, um, you know? Are you praying the same surahs all the time, for example, namaz? Okay, learning new surahs. You know, this is conformity is one of those things. The second thing is monkey see, monkey do. This is how others do it. This is how I've seen them doing it and just continue doing that, but never questioning. Okay. And the third one is making a decision to uh, doing something to please somebody else. Okay. And I can guarantee you, if I replace getting closer to Allah with business building, these are the three cardinal sins of bad decision making. Prime example, what happens in our industry is that, oh, we should do this because Slack does it or Atlassian does it. And we should go that do that too. Well, dude, you're not Slack or Atlassian. Your business is different than <laughs> what Slack and your target audience, your market uh, um, is completely different. So you should not just do monkey see, monkey do in there. And uh, it's, it's like, you know, just, just in that one example, I can tell you that there are so many cases I have avoided bad decision making um, from that one lesson I learned in one kudba has been of perpetual uh, perpetual return um, in there. Uh, another one I'll give you, and this is actually applicable in life uh, more than anything else, is that I think there's a um, hadith where uh, someone asked Prophet Muhammad is that um, you know what is the guarantee? What is a guarantee that you get into? Uh, um, you know, um, uh, to heaven. And he said that um, taqwa, which is remembrance of Allah, and good manners. Yeah. Okay? And somebody else like, so what is guaranteed path to hell? He was like, uh, your tongue and your private parts. I can guarantee you that's the same two things that happens in building a very successful business as well as building a business or career assassination. 
I don't know to go into the detail, but you probably understand how like you know, doing the latter is a suicidal action uh, from career assassination perspective. Like you know, bad mouthing, doing politics, oh, yeah. or doing anything to do with abuse um, 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 at workplaces. These things will destroy your career, your business. On the other hand, side like you know, uh, if I you know uh, you know talk about taqwa in a sense, like you know, validating the vision why. Like you know, why being the most important question in in leadership. Like you know, validating why we are here, what why we are doing what we are doing, and being having good manners and creating a positive culture at workplace, is what actually drives a as, as a great business um, in there. So these are these are probably two fundamental things I would say that I have learned in Kudbas from Hadis in there that. I probably operate my life around. I want to bounce off you. Like, those are really important. And I actually, something that came to my mind is that, like, for example, is I have like a small business that I run, right? So I speak from my own experience. We just sell uh, cricket bats um, locally and um, around Australia as well. So from my experience, you have certain businesses in um, out of all the cricket uh, businesses in Sydney that some of them have bad attitudes and are very, are, are willing to, do dirty things to get like small gains you know what i mean and as a muslim you can't do that obviously right so you're kind of not stuck but you you have set principles to follow and you stick by it and you just do your business right so that's my experience right so you have like businesses out there that do you know shady things but then speaking on your level you know you're speaking with like multi-million dollar companies and stuff you might have the same sort of idea that you know, maybe certain CEOs want to cut corners and do shady things or deals or whatever to get what they want, right? And maybe you yourself have to stick to certain principles and always do it, even though it you might have to, I don't know, pay in excess of $10 million extra to stick to your principles, you still have to sort of get it done. Would you say you have had those sort of experiences where you had to stick by principles? And Look, one of the core values of deputy is uh, what I like to call these, a, you know, integrity and trust. Now, I define integrity as doing the right thing when no one's watching. Yeah. That's that was. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I define trust as absence of any doubt. Okay. So, um, every deputy employee, including myself, I mean, I, there's another thing where I was actually, well, I wasn't actually originally the CEO. I became CEO as part of the one of the fundraisers where the VCs asked me to be the CEO. All oh, right. Um, but a, one thing that is, that I have to lead by example and every leader have to lead by example is these two values. Okay, doing the right thing when no one's watching by our customers, by our team, by um, by the world um, and also having that trust. I mean, deputy, we call this company deputy because it's the second in charge and, you know, you have to have trust on deputy. Okay. Yeah. So this is a... Look, I mean, there's a lot of what's known as... Um, bad shady ideas that businesses today use like you know you would have seen uber doing kind of like you know that black hack for example yeah. where you know there's car disappear if you're a police officer like uber's technique probably has been and i don't want to call uber that bad is that um i'm a customer of uber and i use Uber all the time <laughs> yeah. it's like you know um they have kind of broken the law and then they have begged forgiveness for it later Whereas other companies that have tried to do the right thing from um, from the very beginning in there, now in in today's world there there are things like that happening. There has been quite a lot of scenarios. Actually, if you watch Netflix, there is a um, um, show called Dirty Money, and that actually shows the like you know, how corporations over time have done quite a lot of shady stuff. For example, but now I mean that's that's not look. I mean I I am not or nobody in these companies over here to you know to just. Uh, you know, uh, uh, make money. I'm definitely known it for that. Yeah. This was my passion, my calling. Um, and money is the result of good work you do. Money should never be the focus. Okay? Money is result of good work you do. Money will always come. Your revenue, your profit will come to you if you are doing really good work. And by good work uh, of a business, I mean, is that you are delivering a great product or a great experience to your customer. And um, you're talking about cricket, cricket bats, okay? I'm going to use cricket bats as an example, okay? Um, when you buy, when you as a consumer, you buy something, so if someone's going to buy something from you, um, 
they're actually not just buying the product, they're kind of buying an experience. If they're just buying a product from you, you're probably already destined for failure. The reason you'll be destined for failure is because someone can undercut you in pricing, someone can undercut uh, you, not undercut you, I mean actually overdo or deliver a better experience. Yeah. I mean, theory of disruption is that if you can do something cheaper and better, the keyword is and, not just cheaper, not just better, cheaper and better, you can disrupt anything. Okay. Um, in your business, when you're selling that cricket bat or whatever you're selling, you're actually selling an experience. And the experience is formed by three things. It's the product, it's the environment, and it's the people or service experience. All these three things have to be really great for that consumer to get a great experience. And this is that experience that will bring that customer back again to you. Okay, businesses that are successful today do these three things really, really well. I mean, I'm actually, I've got a Forbes article coming in a couple of weeks Aye. where actually I, I go deeper into it. I mean, my value proposition in deputy, our value proposition in deputy is the fact that we are the people part where we ensure that the people um, bring the best version of themselves to work every day. So that delivery of service, they're smiling, they're doing the best work they can because we ensure that the right kind of people are there, they're Absolutely. not stressed. They're qualified to get that get that work done. So, um, probably long winded answer to your question, no, but that's very good answer. No, that very was super good. insightful. Like I know time's a bit short now, but I did want to ask you another question. I'll probably skip that. I just wanted to get like a quick summation about your um, experience with Muslim entrepreneurship in general and the communities. Uh, I'll ask another really important question after this, but just like a, <laughs> a very short response to this question. Look, I mean, when I started Deputy, uh, the fact that I'm starting my business is not something that I actually even disclose to my family. Okay. I was actually getting married that time and like, you know, um, uh, in Bangla, it's like, Chale I was like, you know, what does the guy do? <laughs> oh, he's gonna, oh, he does, he does, Bapsha, he does business. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't have, wouldn't, wouldn't have sounded, sounded <laughs> that's, a, that's a deal breaker in the Bangla community yeah that, that that's, is that's a deal like, breaker no, in, no, the, no. in the community I mean, like, he's, I not, mean, he's not a doctor he's not an engineer <laughs> <laughs> exactly you know it wouldn't have um, it wouldn't have gone down really well uh, I mean I always joke that my my biggest investor is my wife uh, okay. Sure. Uh, she she supported me through to uh, through my um, in my journey that's over really here cool. and um, and now I mean I don't think the community, especially the Indian subcontinent community, historically has been set up for success as an entrepreneur. For, for yes, entrepreneur. Well. Like, you wouldn't consider this. Like you know, when you're in college, you wouldn't, you wouldn't call your parents and say that, mom, dad, I'm not completing my degree. I'm going to go sub do something called Facebook or I'm going to go Oracle. Like you know, all these Bill Gates, all these people are college dropouts, okay? Yeah, yeah. Your parents are never, never going to approve that, okay? You're going to have to do that degree and be be really, really successful in and getting that job, for example. Um, so, I mean, I don't think the community is is very supportive. I mean, I suppose now I get the recognition because of where I am, but I I probably wasn't disclosing this because it it would have been, it would have tainted, uh, I mean, personally, I wouldn't have cared about what people think about me, but it probably would have impacted my my wife and, and how he met. So, I, for which actually I was never established myself as CEO of Deputy until such time the series, uh, like the first investment of, uh, of 33 million happened into Deputy, at which point I became became CEO. Not that I wanted to become CEO. I don't think I knew how I could be CEO, but, uh, and, uh, um, you know, those who go through fundraising will know what I'm talking about, where I had to go and invest, like, you know, pitch in front of a lot of venture capitalists. Um, in one week in San Francisco, I did about 29 pitches, like, you know, probably oh, yeah. four or five pitches per day. And in one of those uh, pitches, one of the VCs goes like, uh, there's no CEO in the company. What are you guys thinking? And and I said that, well, you know, usually I've seen like, you know, VCs installing a CEO in the company. Yeah. Just and to, sorry, um, for audiences who are not uh, familiar with business lingo, um, venture capitalists is like people that give you money in order to build your business. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, so VC, you can yep. you can get money from a lot of different. You can get money as a loan. You can get money f- uh, government by, grants. Okay, government grants. But you also have venture capitalists where what they do is that they not only put money in the business but they help you run the business yeah. by guiding. 
and providing support. Because each of the panelists would be very experienced in exactly. their own right. Yeah, they're, they're, they're all usually past entrepreneurs themselves. Um, there's a lot of that in the United States, probably a lot less here in Australia, but it's the community is growing like Shark as well. Tank is popularized. Yeah, um, and like in the square peg, we invest in into uh, deputy there is Blackbird. Uh, f- several other uh, venture firms in, in Australia. I mean, in, in one of those meetings, uh, um, for the question of CEO, I said that, like, I know maybe you guys will install one. And they go like, have you ever thought of it yourself? And I'm like, I don't even know what to do as CEO. <laughs> How would I begin? <laughs> yeah. And they go like, it's very simple things. It's, it's three things. Number one, you have to be the holder of the vision. Like, in a, you, there's nobody who can articulate the vision and, um, you know, um, uh, inspire other people in that vision than anybody else, okay? That's one job. The second thing is being the, the yardstick of culture. Like, kind of culture is a very, very important thing in a company. Um, I, I can talk a whole podcast about culture <laughs> if we do another time. But, um, you know, so that people look up to you and how a deputy a, or um, a company employee should behave. And the third one is, you know, you're the guy the users or customers want to look into the eye before they buy your product. And they're like, well, you're already demonstrating these three things and you can um, hire talent who will help you be better at um, every other function. What I didn't realize is that as CEO, you have to be good at everything. <laughs> you have to learn. I mean, everything that I did not know how to do, how to do sales, how to do marketing, how to do finance, how to uh, how to do HR? All these different things I kind of had to learn on the fly. Well, wow. okay. Um, I wish sometime that uh, I had an MBA degree, which would probably made it easier. <laughs> um, doing an MBA degree is probably gonna. If somebody wants to get in the world of entrepreneurship, one, it would definitely one day, help. I mean, I would recommend doing an MBA degree to anybody. I, w- I would like. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're engineering or other fields. I would recommend because simply because it will just open your mind about knowing how the business engine works, what are the, um, you know, levers of growth and how to do organizational development, how to communicate. These things are covered uh, very well in MBA. My wife is doing MBA right now and I'm looking at her course. I'm like, yeah, I've done it, learned the hard way. <laughs> I, I wish I, I, should, I wish to do a course to know that, not about that. I wanted to add um, some thoughts before I ask you the final question, but in terms of you mentioned like um, what a, someone expects from a CEO, I was actually reading um, Stephen. I think Stephen Covey's um, successful traits of oh sorry effective traits of highly successful people. He said um, he gave an example how uh, he gave an analogy of people cutting like trees down in a forest. So and he gave that he linked it back to like running a business. So the workers are the people who are actually cutting like the trees like physically. The I think managers are the people who are actually telling the people how to cut the tree, and and dire- directing them. And the CEO, or the head, is like the one looking over all the forest and telling you which direction to cut, like which way to go, mm. and telling the manager. And <laughs> it's like so he gave that example. So it's like linking back to what you said. Like you have to have that vision. So that's what he said about which direction of like the trees to cut in the forest, because that's what the CEO kind of um, takes care of um, when they're doing that. So I want to ask you one final question, though. So we asked this question to um, every guest that we have um, on Boys in the Cave. So if you had, so because we're called Boys in the Cave, so if you could pick three people in history, um, except for the Sahaba and Rasulullah because everyone's going to pick them anyway. <laughs> so for the sake of Adab, we'll say they're already in the cave. Um, who else would you want to have a chat with in a cave? Three people in history. It can be anyone. Somebody who's inspired you. Or even you. present time, you can, yeah, just three people that have kind of ins- inspired you. Oh, you're just interested to have a conversation or a long life conversation with them. Long life conversation yeah, it's with them. The hardest question all the time. Wow. Stumps okay. people. I, <laughs> we'll give you some time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, yeah. I mean, if you gave me time, I would have. I would have. But, like, you know, I mean, uh, in a cave, who would I like to get stuck in an airport with? I'd like to say, in a sense that I can learn uh, more from them. So, something that I do is, I mean, when I interview, and by the way, just to back up on the trees example, um, to be successful in business, you need three things. Anybody, not, no matter what business you do, you need great strategy. You need great people and you need great execution. Okay. If you get the first two right, you get the third for free. 
actually it's a joke mm-hmm. <laughs> it's all down to execution okay <laughs> execution where uh, the you know rubber meets the road in there so um yeah like you know cutting trees or not you you need and as ceo you're responsible for all three you you have to have that strategy of the vision you also have to hire really really great people and the great people is not a one-off thing as the company scales somebody who was right for the company when you know you had one million revenue it might not be the right kind of person when you have a hundred million re- uh, or ten million revenue for example okay there's people you need to the right the definition of great people the right people keeps changing uh, as the business is scaling i mean the way i like to tell it is that think about a business being um, a human body and if the business grows 100 percent, the body is growing 100 percent. now every human being is like a joint in there if one of those joints don't grow the body is going to crumble so the definition of great people also keeps changing and it's all about the execution so um um you have to be very very mindful of that in as you, as you're building your business back to your question about who would i like to have um now this is going to sound really really odd okay uh because the answer can be a, a red really a wrongly one would have been Genghis Khan <laughs> okay and I mean Ex- as, 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 we'll give you the like a, 19 people that took over the world in there uh, that would have been even though he's known for all the brutality and things but I probably don't want to spend the cave with him okay <laughs> but I would like to I would like to interview and understand okay like you know someone from a little tribe who goes and conquers the world Google, in Google there hang out from <laughs> yeah, a different Google cave. Hangout probably yeah that's right um <laughs> Look, I mean, people who have had that I've learned so much from, people I would like to meet. One of them would have been this gentleman called. Uh, he's a very successful VC, probably the best CEO of our time. Is um, uh, Ben Horowitz? Okay, he's, he, he founded Anderson Horowitz Venture Capital um, in there. Um, and like you know, someone I really aspire to and look up to right now is someone like um, um, you know uh, um, Elon Musk, for example. I mean, I I struggle so much. Then Elon Musk is running that many, like you know, at least three very very successful company. It it is the, you know, it would be mind blowing to know, like you know, how he solves problem. I mean, one of the principles he carries, he calls it the first principles way of solving problem. I don't know whether you guys heard about no, that. I haven't. No. So first principles is like you know, taking something and boiling things down to is absolute fundamental truth. And then reasoning up from there. Now, I'm not going to explain it. I mean, if for the audience or for yourselves, just go to YouTube and type in uh, Elon Musk, Kevin Rose, First Principles. There's a two minute, 51 seconds video that you can watch. It's probably going to give you more wisdom about how you should look at how to solve problems in life. All right. Okay. In the first reaction to go like, I don't know. I don't know. Then I'm not going to try. It's probably the wrong thing, but um, when you apply that principle on breaking things down, is probably something like probing you know, questions. Yeah, okay. like you know, really, really breaking things down physics way, and then reasoning up from there would be would be really, um, really interesting. You have one more. Who's I think that was, oh, that was three. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, there you go. But yeah, those were really good insights because even like at Boys in the Cave, we get a lot of different speakers, are mostly chefs, you know, academics and stuff. But we also aim to get you know business-minded uh, people, people who run companies, businesses as well, because it's about having that mindset, and getting insight into you know Islam and how it kind of plays out in the corporate life and that. So it was really amazing uh, episode. I definitely learned a lot and something I'm gonna. There's a lot of things to take away from this episode. Jazakallah khair um, for coming on yeah, Boys in the okay. Cave. It was really. Um, I love the conversation. We I appreciate your time. We appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate no, no, absolutely. Time. Uh, thank you very much uh, for for having me here. Hopefully, um, you know, I I've inspired someone out there to go and. And take the um, take the leap of uh, faith of jumping off a cliff as well, and building but, a plane. Well, and building a plane where, <laughs> you, where, you, where you're flying. I mean, look, I mean, our, our community can definitely um, definitely benefit from having more entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs. Now is a great time to be alive. From a you know, we're in the this um, you know industrial revolution that's taking place right now, and there are so many problems yet to be solved. Absolutely.
so um, sometimes i yeah. think about like and if i'm not doing deputy these are the other things i could be doing <laughs> so uh yeah i mean hopefully it inspires somebody else for taking that thank sure. you so for all listeners thank you for giving us your attention if you have any questions or comments feel free to email us at info at boys in the cave.com or find us on facebook and you can follow our journey through instagram Please leave a five-star rating on iTunes as that greatly helps us. And make sure you leave a comment as well because that helps us through the rankings. And I don't know if you guys have been following our Facebook. We actually have been ranked, uh, I think, a month back, uh, number three on religion and spirituality. In iTunes Calgary, overall, right? In iTunes Australia. So uh, keep supporting us, inshallah, because, you know, we've got many different plans, projects that we want to expand. So we've got, you know, a big uh, vision like definitely taking more points from Ashik Pai in terms of vision and stuff. So we're going to implement that into uh, Boys in the Cave as well. And you can definitely support us on patreon.com slash boys in the cave. Um, there's different ties where you can donate monthly and that will really assist us with the running costs with this podcast because we got to upload it onto Libsyn, you know, all the platforms, iTunes and stuff. It costs money, even overseas guests, like we do video, the, that all that all that software costs money. So inshallah support us in that way. So from our special guest, Ashik Ahmed, Paya and my um and Akib and myself, we wish you all the best. This is Tandem signing off. Assalamualaikum.